Welcome back to ECE 501B. We are continuing with our material in Chapter 3. Homework 3 is not due in a week, but in two weeks from today. It has a few more exercises, and they're not all directly out of the textbook. But it's, we're still continuing to take our exercises from the second edition of Axler. Our first exam is two weeks from Wednesday, the 30th of September. And there should be material posted on the D2L website helping you better understand what it is that we are doing or what the exams might look like relative to the types of problems and the level of difficulty. Today what I want to do is cover two of the critical fundamental subspaces or spaces associated with linear operators or linear maps, I should say, will eventually get to operators. Operators, we're sort of reserving that terminology for when our input space is the same as our output space. Right now, we're keeping it general. We're saying that our input vector space is V, the output vector space is W, and those don't have to be the same. And our maps in general are some linear map T. We are going to define what we mean by the null space and the range space. We will show that the range space is indeed a subspace. We won't show that in the case of the range space, but it also is a subspace. There are subspaces of the two different vector spaces. The null space is a subspace of the input vector space. The range space is a subspace of the output vector space, W. We will then talk about injective maps and surjective maps. And there is a reason why I've underlined the ends in injective and null, just so that maybe you can make this connection and I've underlined the R in surjective and the R in range space. There's a connection, and we'll establish that or show that connection of an injective map, which really means one-to-one, -one, and a surjective map, which means onto. Those two different maps will then be connected, or we'll try to show how they are related to null space and range space, and then we will get into properties of these linear maps, maps and dimensions, and matrix representations of linear maps. I wrote this ahead of time just because I didn't want to write it now, but I'll try to go slow and we'll pick up essentially after the picture. So I'm not going to just continually scroll through this material. We'll slow down and have you follow along, but I think I'll give you enough time to write this down anyway, but if I don't, you always have the notes available on D2L. What is this thing that we're referring to as a null space? The null space is a subset of the input space, this input space V. It's some set in there that maps all of these vectors in V to the zero element in the output space. And we can define that somewhat in equation form. We can say given a linear map T, where this linear map T is taking an input vector space into an output vector space, V into W, that's what I'm meaning by the first line of that definition, then we are defining the null of t, or my, I may actually say script n of t to mean the null space. The null space of t are all of the vectors in our input space v, all these little vectors, little v, in the input vector space v, such that when we map those through the linear map t, they map to zero. They map to the origin, so to speak or the zero vector. And here's a picture of that. And here I'm just drawing clouds. 
but we have the domain V, that's our input space, on the left. We have our codomain W. I'm not calling that the range because we will reserve the term range to possibly be a subset within the codomain. So I'll try to be consistent in the terminology, but we have a domain and we have a codomain of this linear map T. And here I'm just illustrating potential vectors that are starting at the tail of these red lines. That might be a vector little v1, another little vector v2, another vector v sub 3, and they may all, when mapped through this linear map capital T, go into the zero vector in our output space. The collection or the subset of those little v's is what we call the null space of that linear map, meaning everything in that blue cloud on the left essentially maps into the zero vector and you're really, those are indistinguishable at the output of that linear map. You don't know where you started necessarily in this subset, which I'm calling script N of T. Let's look at some examples of null spaces. And here we will do this for more than just the conventional, let's say, columns of numbers or these vectors. Let's look at the differentiation map, where now we have this linear map T taking polynomials over the field of real numbers into the set of all polynomials over the real numbers. And we want to know, is there some collection of polynomials that when operated on by this linear map, map to the zero polynomial in the set of all polynomials? In terms of our set terminology, we're saying all P that live in this set of all polynomials such that TP, or this linear differentiation map, applied to that polynomial give us zero. And we're trying to identify all of those little P's, where these P's are coming from the set of all polynomials. Can you give me another way of essentially identifying that collection of polynomials P? What polynomials, when differentiated once, give you zero? So if P is just a constant, if all the other coefficients on, let's say, x, x squared, x cubed are all zero, then as long as we have A, let's say, where A is the real, here I'm saying that A is a constant, where this P of X is in fact just a constant. We differentiate a constant, we get zero. All P of X's, so A could be anything as long as it's a real number. It can't be a power of X or a coefficient of a power of X. But all of those constants in this collection of all polynomials those form the null space of this differentiation map T between the set of all polynomials and its codomain, which is the set of all polynomials. That's one example of a null space. What about another one where, let's say, now we will look at 
something a little bit more like these tall skinny vectors, dimension changing. Suppose now our linear map is such that we go from R3 into R2. For example, suppose that we had a linear map operating on this three vector, x, y, z. x, y, and z are the three coordinates in the R3 vector. And now let's say that that, by definition of this linear map, takes us to two coordinates, where the two coordinates are defined by some combination of x, y, and z. The first coordinate is 2x minus y plus 3z. And the second coordinate is 7x plus 5y minus 6z. And we are now interested in what collection of points, x, y, z, will map to 0, 0 in R2. And sometimes I'll write that as a row vector. Sometimes I'll stand it up on end and write it as a column vector. I kind of pick and choose what I feel like doing, but I'm really meaning it's the same sort of three coordinate vector. But this x, y, z map, what points map into 0, 0? in R2, where this is now the zero vector in our codomain W. Can you sort of give me a parameterized description of what X, Y, and Z's make this happen? We need both of those coordinate expressions to be zero, don't we? And then we'll have it. So we need x, y, and z to actually satisfy 2x minus y plus 3z equal to zero and 7x plus 5y minus 6z to equal zero. Or we could say that the null of t is now the set of three vectors, x, y, and z, belonging to R3, such that 2x minus y plus 3z is equal to zero and 7x plus 5y minus 6z is equal to 0. And you can, I hope, start to envision now this three-dimensional space. And can you now find points that are such that 2x minus y plus 3z is equal to 0. I think you can maybe go to that point in 3 space as far as where is 2x minus y plus 3z as a point. Where is the point 7x plus 5y minus 6z? And you can actually show that there's a line that connects those, and that's now the line that lives in the null space of this map, capital T. It's possible to show, and I'm just going to say can be shown, that the null space of T is now the span of, and when I start talking about span, I like to see them stacked. That's what I said before when I said I may be switching between rows and columns. 
that this is now minus 0 0.5 in a decimal form to 4, 1.941 and 1. And if you want to see that in a more rational expression, we still have 1 for the z. So if you now look at this line, it has it's proportional to anything that's proportional to this line, which has a z coordinate of 1, a y coordinate of 33 over 17, not quite 2, and an x coordinate of minus 9 over 17, not quite 1, or a little bit more than 1 half, then that would lie in this null space of this linear map T. And if you plug these numbers into these two expressions, 2x minus y plus 3z and 7x plus 5y minus 6z, you will satisfy both of those. They will both give you an answer of zero. So anything that's in the span of that, that just means that we can scale that. Any linear combination of this, these three coordinates will give us exactly 0, 0 in our codomain. And that's what I mean by the span. It doesn't have to be that particular vector. It can be any scaled version of that vector. And that will then put us at the origin. So anything that lies on that line defined by those three coordinates will map to the 0 vector in R2. That's what we mean by the null space. Let's look at another example. Suppose we have a map T. Now, this dimension changing example, we went from a big dimension to a smaller dimension. Now we're going to go from a smaller dimension to a larger dimension. Question? So now, so now all of these potential vectors that would be in the null space of this linear map have to live in R3 because that's the input vector space. It's R3. It's X, Y, Z. So we're looking in all of X, Y, Z and we're saying what points in this X, Y, Z space will map to the origin? And in this case, we actually have that. We have a non-trivial null space a trivial null space would be the origin. We know that, or the zero vector, I should say. The zero vector in R3, obviously, with a linear map, maps into the zero vector in the codomain. That's what we'll call the trivial null space. If that's the only vector that makes this linear map go to the zero vector. But here we have a non-trivial vector that will actually map to the zero vector in our output space. That's from big to small. Let's look at small to big. And you should all be able to visualize this. <laughs> Not. We're going from R3 to R5. So now we'll just have to sort of rely on our algebraic manipulation and our understanding of what happens via extension when we go from a real line to the plane, then from the plane to R3, then from this three-dimensional space, what happens next, etc. Now we're going from R3 and R5. Suppose that we now are looking at a linear map. Again, we're calling it T such that we take these three coordinates in R3, X, Y, and Z, and now those map into five coordinates in a 
five by one vector, where the five coordinates are minus x plus y minus 3z. Second coordinate is minus x plus 2y minus 4z. Third coordinate is the sum of x, y, and z with unity scaling. The fourth coordinate is 2x plus 3y plus z. And the fifth coordinate is x plus 2z. And we would like to know, is there any non-trivial value for x, y, and z that would cause this five column, this five coordinate vector in R5 to be zero? I hope it's clear that if we picked zero, zero, zero for x, y, z, a linear map is going to give us a zero vector in the output. That's our trivial vector in the null space. What do we need our right-hand side in this map to equal? We need it to be the zero vector. We're looking now for the following. We need the right-hand side five zeros stacked on top of each other in R5 for some, let's say, V, which is X, Y, Z, in R3. And we're not guaranteed that that will have a non-trivial answer. But in this case, the linear map was selected to be something that we will get a non-zero, a non-trivial null space vector. This actually yields, the null space of T is now the span of a vector minus 2, 1, 1. And any linear combination of that set of coordinates, minus 2, 1, 1, will map to this column of five zeros. Question? Do you always ignore the trivial case? No, it's important when we're reporting the null space. Typically, if we say what's the null space of this linear map, we're really sort of suggesting what's the non, is there, are there non-trivial vectors? So, there is always the case where we will have this trivial vector, and sometimes it's very important when we only have the trivial vector in the null space, and that's what we'll start talking about when we start talking about injective maps. So it's important to know that that vector exists, but typically when we say, okay, what's the null space of this linear map, we're usually saying, are there any non-trivial vectors that give us the zero vector in the output space. There will always be a trivial case because it's a linear map. Now, what did I want to make? Let me make one point relative to this discussion. In this last example, the dimension of R3, which was our dimension of the domain, was equal to 3, and that was less than the dimension of R5, which was 5, and this was our codomain. Typically, it's almost the other way around. Usually, your domain, well, I shouldn't say that, but a lot of the times in the problems that we'll be thinking about, our domain is a vector of dimension larger than the dimension of our codomain vector. But it doesn't have to be. We're just now talking about linear maps. 
again, this proposition is a labeling from the second edition, but the proposition 3.1 that I want to talk about now states that the null space of a linear math T such that V is taken into W is in fact a subspace of the domain vector space V. If you had to prove that on an exam, what are you wanting to start thinking about if we're trying to demonstrate that something is a subspace? So it needs to have an additive identity, has to have a zero element, that subspace. So the origin has to live in that subspace. If we start adding things in that subspace, they need to remain in the subspace. It's closed under addition. And if we scale any vectors in that subspace with a scalar from our field, then that also, that scaled vector, needs to be in the subspace. So we're looking for closed under multiplication. If we're doing this proof, then the subspace must satisfy three properties. One is it contains the additive identity. Let's just say that I want to see what happens to the zero vector when I map it through this linear map T for a generic linear map T. Well, I can rewrite that zero vector as a linear combination of two zero vectors because I know if I add zero to a vector, I get the vector back and I started with the zero vector. So this may look silly what I'm doing, but here I'm just saying I want to utilize the additive identity in my domain space V. And by definition of the additive identity, when it's added to any vector in your vector space V, you get back the vector that you started with. So this is a reasonable expression, but now I want to utilize the fact or apply the additivity of my linear map. I assume T was a linear map. That allows me now to express that most recent expression as T of 0 plus T of 0. This is just additivity of the linear map. Now what I have on the right-hand side is actually 2 t of 0. But if I have a vector t of 0, which is the output of a linear map, equaling to 2 times that vector, what's that saying about the vector? The vector has to be 0. If I can take the vector and scale it by a factor of 2 and I keep the vector that I started with, this is now saying, therefore, this resulting vector, t of 0, is equal to 0. And the output of that linear map, by definition of the linear map mapping from v to w, that 0 vector lives in the codomain w. So now we've shown that the zero vector is an element of the null space of T, where this particular zero vector 
is in V. Again, that zero is overloaded. <laughs> what it means depends on the context or where it is in our discussion. Now we know the additive identity belongs to the null space. We need to now show that the null space is closed under addition. So let's start with two vectors, u and v, and let's just allow them both to be in the null space of T. Then T of U plus V by the additivity of our linear map is T of U plus T of V. But by definition of U and V, I started with those being in the null space. That's now zero plus zero, which is zero. And again, that's in our codomain W. And now if I just look at the leftmost expression, which is the linear map applied to u plus v, that equals the rightmost vector, which is the zero vector in our codomain. We now know that u plus v is in the null space of T, and that's what we needed to show, that for any linear combination of vectors starting in the null space, their linear combination is in the null space. We're closed under addition. We could have had any kind of scaling on u and v if we wanted to. I just left them as u plus v. Finally, let's look at showing that it's this null space is closed under scalar multiplication. Again, let's start with some information. Suppose that we start with a vector u in the null space, and let's pick a scalar a from our field. And those are arbitrary vectors and scalars out of our null space and our field of numbers. Then again, sort of following the same argument that we just did, we can say, let's apply that linear map to this scaled vector u. So we're applying this linear map to a u. By the homogeneity property of that linear map, we know that's a t of u. But we already picked u to be in the null space of t. So that says that a is going to scale the zero vector by definition of u being in the null space of t, and a0 is just 0 in our codomain, in our output space. Again, looking at the leftmost entry and the rightmost entry, that's saying then that a u, this scaled version of u, is in the null space of t, so it's closed under scalar multiplication, Consequently, then, the null space of T is, in fact, a subspace of V. Now let's look at what is termed an injective map. And again, you might keep in mind this n in the word injective because we're going to try to make a connection of an injective map with the null space. Let's now define what we mean by an injective map. Given a linear map T between V and W,
if, so that's just given, we're, we have a linear map that's coming from this collection of linear maps between V and W, if, whenever U and V are coming from the domain, capital V, and it just so happens that T of U is equal to T of V, or the linear map is applied to U and it's applied to V, and we end up with those two outputs being the same. If that implies U equal to V, then the map is said to be injective, or you might hear it referred to as one-to-one. -one. So if you take two vectors in V, what you think are two vectors, and T of U is equal to T of V, and that actually means that U is equal to V, then you have an injective map, or a map that is one to one. And recall that we had, to begin with, for our linear map, that was mapping into unique outputs. So now recall that T of U already selected a unique element in our codomain, or in W. Which means then that in an injective map, only a single element of V maps to that unique element in W. That's by definition of the injective map. Yes? No. So the question was, is it true that all linear maps are injective? No. So we'll try to show some examples or, or illustrate injective maps or actually more appropriately for you, a non-injective map. So let's keep going and see what this injective map means. So there is a... Pardon? So now I'm not sure that I'm hearing, but I'll try to draw some functions that maybe show what this one-to-one -one or this injective map might be. So there is a one-to-one -one relationship between elements of the domain and the codomain. Meaning, again, if we start drawing these cloud pictures, where this is now V and this is W, and we're mapping between those with this linear map T, then what we're saying is that a unique starting point will go to a unique point in the codomain. Or another maybe more 
functional description of that, suppose that we now have the following. Suppose that I now have this, whoops, I wanted that to be a different code. Function f of x. We have x, which is in our domain, and it's mapping through this function f of x. I don't like the way I've drawn that. That shouldn't be. No, I just don't want it to have any possibility of failing the next test, which I'm going to try to illustrate. If I drew a horizontal line, <laughs> pretend that's a horizontal line, that can't go through f of x in more than one place. That's my test for this being a one-to-one -one or an injective map. Each horizontal line only passes through one point on our function f of x. So that, if you wanted to look at a particular example, for example, maybe your f of x is e to the x. Then for every value, real value x, you get a unique answer, e of x. Meaning in this particular function, I can't find let's say a point, well, I'll think of the x squared function, that is not one to one, because I could find a minus two, and f of minus two is four, and f of two is four. They give me the same f of x result, and your horizontal line passes through that function, or it it hits more than one point in that function. And what we want is given a particular x, we want only one result to come out of that. Now here's where I was leading up to before. There's a strong relationship between the null space of a map, a linear map, and whether the map is in fact injected. Which is proposition 3.2. Suppose we have a linear map T between our domain V and our codomain W. And suppose T is inject, well, okay. Let's say that T is injective that's true if and only if, and I'm just going to say I double F, which means if and only if the null space of that T is in fact trivial. It's only the zero vector.
So let's see if we'll prove this and then we'll go through an illustration of a non-injective, something that has a non-trivial null space and it's linear and consequently it's not an injective map, meaning we can get two different vectors that aren't equal that end up taking us to exactly the same location in our codomain. That's what we mean by a non-injective map. So let's look at a proof of this proposition to begin with. And how are we going to prove an if and only if? We can prove both sides. One goes to the other and the other goes to the one. So let me just write that out. To prove an if and only if, have to show implication in both directions. The first part then, let's go ahead and assume that T, our linear map, is in fact injected. And that's the assumption that we're making. Now let's pick a, a vector, V, that's in the null space of T. What's T of V? That's zero by definition of V. By the choice of V, we know that linear map takes V and takes it to the zero vector. V is in null space of T. Now if we go back to proposition 3.1, There we used or we determined that the null space of our linear map contained the zero vector. Since we said the null space of T was a subspace. If that's the case, now we know that T of the zero vector, where what's this, where does this zero vector live? This is in our domain or V, zero vector in V. That now maps, since zero is the zero vector is in our null space, that actually maps to zero. Where and where is this zero vector? So that's the zero vector in our codomain. And now we have t of v equaling 0 and t of 0 equaling 0. So they're the same. t of v is equal to 0, which is equal to t of 0. And that's really what we were wanting to use. We assumed that t was an injective map. Now, if t of a vector is equal to t of another vector, those two vectors have to be the same by definition of the injective map, and that's what we assumed in this half of the proof. We assumed t was injective. Now we've shown that t of v is equal to t of 0, and since it's injective, we know that the arguments v and 0 have to be the same vector. by definition of a map being injective, that means that V is equal to zero. Therefore, we have shown 
that T being injective implies the null space of T only contains the zero vector. Now let's go the other direction. Let's assume that our null space of the linear map is trivial, that it only contains the zero vector. Assume the null space of T is equal to zero. which is what we could say is the trivial null space. Now let's pick a couple of vectors in our domain. So let's let u and v be in our domain v, and let's assume that t of u is equal to t of v. So we pick u and v such that t of u is equal to t of v. Well, now we can play games with that equality. We can say 0 is equal to t of u minus t of v. We can subtract t of v from both sides, for example. But now we can play on the additivity of our linear map. And now that says that t of u minus v is equal to 0. And now that says that u, the vector u minus v is in the null space of our linear map t. And what did we say our null space was? We only had one vector in our null space by assumption. And u minus v, that vector is in that null space. So now we can say that u minus v is the zero vector. Or u is equal to v. Therefore, t of u equal to t of v, that's how we pick u and v, implies u is equal to v. And this was, in fact, the definition of an injective map. And now we've proved the other direction. Therefore, we have shown that the null space of T being this trivial subspace zero implies that our linear map was injected. Therefore, T is injective if and only if the null space of T contains only the trivial vector. And there's the connection then between an injective map and the null space of a linear map. If the null space of a linear map is only the zero vector, then that map is injective. That's proposition 3.2. So let me show you, this will really convince you, let me draw a picture with clouds again. <laughs> so now we have a non-injective map.
which again, with pictures of clouds, don't go home and tell your roommate or your parents or anybody that, oh, we were just playing with clouds today in my graduate level electrical and computer engineering. So here are two clouds. Here's our domain V and here's our codomain W. A non-injective map means that everything, well, I shouldn't say, there are points over here that are different, but yet they map to the zero vector. And in this, so this is our zero vector over there. And now we're saying that, in fact, the null space of T is non-trivial. for a non-injective map. Let me see if I can do a little bit better, and I think maybe we'll have to wait until, well, let's see what, yeah, I'm kind of wanting to finish up range space and surjective before I start getting into too many examples, but let's just look at Again, maybe not a very, it's not a real specific example, but suppose T, it is a specific example, it's just not with a linear, specific linear map. Let's just look at a generic linear map. Suppose T has a non-trivial null space. Again, think about that one example that we just already had, where we were doing this dimension changing and we went from R3 to R2. There was a line that was in the null space. We had points in R3 that would map to zero. Just keep that in mind. Think, oh, I can pull a point that's not equal to the zero vector that will take me to the origin. Keep that in mind. Okay, you can find points in this three space that will take you to the origin. Keep that in mind as I'm going through this illustration with a generic linear map. So suppose T has a non-trivial null space, which is what that dimension changing did from R3 to R2. It did have a non-trivial null space. It had a, a vector, a line. Let's now suppose, or let's let W... 1 equal T of V. So now we've picked a V that generates some non-zero output vector W1. And let's let T of U actually produce zero so that U, our vector U, is in the null space of this linear map where U is not equal to zero. Think back about our dimension changing expression. So here, I that is, U is in the null space of T with U not equaling the zero vector. Is that okay? So now I have two vectors, V and U, and they're both in the domain. U, coincidentally, actually maps to the zero vector. So it's in the null space. V is just a generic vector that maps to another point in the codomain. What happens if I now say, let me define Z, which is just a linear combination of V and U? What's T of Z? 
So now you're getting the idea. This is now t of v plus u, but now t is a linear map, so additivity can be used. t of v plus t of u. What's t of v by definition of v? That's w1. What's t of u? That's zero. So now we have t of z giving rise to w of 1. And t of v actually gave rise to w1. The same point in our codomain, but what do we know about z and v? They are not the same because they differ by u, and u is non-zero. U is not the additive identity. Therefore, T of Z, which was equal to W1, but W1 was also equal to T of V, that did not imply that Z was equal to V. And we needed that for our map to be one-to-one -one or to be injected. So there is an illustration of a non-injective map or a linear map that has a non-trivial null space that is then not one-to-one -one, or it's not injective, which really says that if you have a non-trivial null space, then the map is not injected. And now do you see that you could end up in some place, some location, W1, and now you don't really know where you started with a non-injective map. You could have started at Z, you could have started at V, and they would have both delivered you to W1. And that's because you have a non-trivial null space. You can play in that non-trivial null space and add those vectors however you want to V to produce a new Z and get you to the same W1. So that null space can be utilized to your advantage, or maybe you need to, whoa, wait a minute, I have a non-trivial null space. I, I could have some funny things happening. You now maybe understand a little bit better what happens with these non-trivial null spaces. Let's look at the other subspace that I promised we would look at today, and that's this range. Sorry, I started singing home, home on the range, but that's not what we're meaning here. This is now a subspace in our codomain, the range, but it really does, you could sort of view it as this space, a nice range. So the range of a linear map where the linear map is coming from this set of linear maps between a domain V and codomain W is the set of vectors or elements in our codomain W which are of the form W is equal to T of V. For V belonging to our domain. The range is where can you potentially end up in your codomain from using this linear map on your domain. And if you wanted to, you could experimentally just generate 
a large number of little v's and see where does that map in the codomain. And that's now your range. I know you're looking for clouds, so I will draw you some clouds. Here's another cloud diagram. Here is V and here is W. We are again using a linear map between V and W, but in this case, we're going to potentially different locations in W in our codomain, but it doesn't necessarily have to fill the entire codomain. This is now where we can get to through that linear map T. Or the range of T, which I might write as script R of T, similarly to how I had script N of T for the null space, the range of T is the set of all W's where those W's are determined from the mapping of T onto V, such that V is anywhere in your domain. In other words, the range of T is all the possible outputs in W. Question? So now the question was, is the range of our linear map equal to the dimension of our codomain? I think that's the question. And from that picture, it should be obvious. It's not necessarily. Yes, so now what we can have is the, how do I want to say this? The range could be a subspace within the codomain. That's what I want to say now, actually. So it doesn't have to fill the entire codomain vector space. It doesn't have to fill all of W, the range space of W. You might have, let's say, W is R3, and maybe you can only get to a plane in R3 through these vector, or through using the linear map T applied to some vector space V. So you end up in this plane, not in filling the entire R3. And that's your range space of that linear map. That picture was just supposed to be giving it all. Obviously, maybe it didn't. But that cloud is smaller than W. That's what I'm meaning, graphically. So it is a subset of that. If we recall that the null space of T, we proved, in fact, that that is a subspace of our domain V. That was Proposition 3.1. Maybe or maybe not, maybe you would expect then something similar with the range space, and in fact that's Proposition 3.3. .3. The range of T is a subspace, not of V, but of our codomain. And I'm not going to go through the proof. That's in the textbook, so I'll just say 
C axler, but it's similar. You now have to show these three properties hold for the range space of this linear map. C axler for proof. What I do want to do is talk about a surjective map. We had an injective map, which was one to one. This particular map, surjective, has an R in it, the word, and we are going to see if we can make this connection with a surjective map and the range space. And that's related to the previous question. Is the range space going to fill or be all of our codomain? so to speak. Here's what we mean by a map being surjective. A map, T, a linear map, T, that's, I hope, well, I'll make it clear by saying T is this coming from our set of linear maps. Is surjective if the range of t in fact is our codomain or equals w. Another way of saying that then is every vector in our codomain w is a possible output of the linear map T. Now remember what our sort of function looked like before when we had an injective map. Now we have X, let's say, in our domain. Suppose now that we have <coughs> this map, f of x, w, w is our vertical axis. Is this a one-to-one -one map? No, but can we get everywhere on the vertical axis with this map? Yes, as long as I'm extending it up and down as far as I want. So here, we can say crucially dependent, this map is crucially dependent on how the linear map T is defined, this notion of a map being surjective. And I not sure I'm going to get all the way through it, but you can find this in the textbook. And it actually is utilizing this differentiation map or derivative map. And what we're really playing on is how this map is defined in terms of what is its domain and what is its codomain. Suppose we have one map that's the derivative map, let me call that T sub 1, that is this linear map from m-dimensional polynomials over the reals is its domain and its codomain is the same set of polynomials, where T1 applied to a P is just the derivative of P. That's what I, how I'm defining this derivative map. Is T1 surjective? Can I cover all of, or can I get to all m-dimensional polynomials through this map T1, if I start with all m-dimensional polynomials. As a map, T1 is or is not 
surjective. Is it clear that it's not? You could start with a, a linear polynomial. You take its first derivative and what you end up with? A constant. So if little m was 1, you aren't going to get back into linear functions if you're differentiating them. Question? So then if it was infinite dimensional, it could be. It's easier to say, let's just let our domain be m and our codomain be m minus 1. <laughs> then that's an easier one to sort of think about. And then you do have a surjective map, and it's, it's the same operator. It's a derivative operator. It's the same linear map. It's just how you've defined the domain and the codomain that makes it either surjective or not surjective. Is that clear? So it's critical or crucial how you define your domain and codomain. And you might look at that between now and the next time we meet, and we will pick up with these notions next time.